Hi everyone, Doug DeVos here, and uh, I'm thrilled to be able to uh, in introduce a session that we just had recently with Dr. Jeff Myers, who is the uh, president and CEO of Summit Ministries. And you know, their work is all about you know a, a biblical worldview and and how to help people shape their lives with that worldview. And and I thought it was really. A, a fascinating conversation. I've thought about it a lot uh, uh, since we had the time uh, to be together uh, because he connected the dots uh, of faith and belief with the reality that we see around us every day and that we can trust our eyes, we can trust common sense, we can look at those things and that it actually uh, reveals to us truth in a in a deeper and more meaningful way, and so uh, you know he, he's he, as he said he's not a theologian he, he's a, a philosopher he comes at it you know in a different uh, in a different way, and um, and I think you're going to find it uh, uh, really enjoyable. I hope it challenges you and stretches you, and I hope it helps you uh, uh, think through some of the things that you see and certainly some of the things that you believe. So uh, have a good time listening to it. We believe and have always believed in this country that man was created in the image of God, that he was given talents and responsibilities and was instructed to use them to make this world a better place in which to live. And you see, this is the really great thing of America. It's time to discover what binds us together, and finding it has the power to transform our world. That's what I believe. How about you? We'll kind of start diving yeah. in a little bit here, and, and first of all, just thanks for you know, thanks for being in uh, here in uh, you know, in Grand Rapids. Uh, you know, beautiful weather here. We always welcome our friends with the with the best that we can offer. Um, but uh, we're just thrilled because I had so much fun being on your podcast. I really yeah. appreciated it, enjoyed it, and I've watched other podcasts that you've done uh, with guests that you've had, uh, and, and just you know, finding out more about Summit Ministries and, and all of that. Uh, you know, your role there as president. And it's been fun to learn about Summit Ministries and, and that role. But maybe you can start. Why don't we start with you just telling us a little bit about Summit Ministries and a little bit about you? Now, how did how did it get started? And how did you get connected? And give us a background so everyone, as we uh, as we dive into this discussion and as we talk about belief systems. Um, you know, you, we can kind of kind of get a, a, a bit of a foundation from you, and then we'll have a, a, a you know, I'll try to frame it a little bit more after after that. I, I think my story and some ministry story fit together, and it, it's it's really cool. I, I was I grew up in Michigan, actually. Oh, did you? I was really? well, I born in Mount Clemens, grew up in Royal Oak. Uh, I was a tiny kid when there were riots. Okay, destroyed the city. Yeah, and my parents, after many years of trying to make it work there, and they had good businesses and it was working well. But they fled okay. back to Kansas. Okay. Now that's culture shock. That's right. From Detroit, Michigan <laughs> to Gray Bend, Kansas, from a large church to a little tiny church. But I was always that kid growing up who was asking, why? What, yeah. Why do we believe what we believe? You say we believe in God. How do we know there is a God? Yeah. We see that we're created. How do we know? Maybe we have just evolved through random chance processes. I was always asking these questions. And, and our little church, country church, lovely people. I mean, yeah. they loved us. They invested in us. They fed us. You know, it was just, it was wonderful. But they didn't orient toward the kinds of questions that I was asking. And I thought, you know, when it comes to belief systems for the rest of my life, I don't think a faith belief system is going to work for me because the people I know who have the deepest faith don't have answers to the kinds of questions that I think are really important. Yeah. So... I decided, you know, when I graduate from high school, I'm going to quietly graduate from church. I went out to Summit Ministries, which is a is a Christian program. Yeah. And keeping them in mind, I, I wasn't really... So you went through one of the programs. I went through one of the programs. Okay. I wasn't committed to this worldview okay. at this point. Uh, but I, I asked the founder of the program, who turns out to, didn't know this at the time, turns out to have been this brilliant philosopher named David Noble. I said, I hope you have a lot of answers because I have a lot of questions. <laughs> that was my whole attitude. That's so cool because you know, I, it, it, we, we were talking earlier today was with some of the team here uh, uh, about our church, and one of the I remember a, a, a sermon years ago says, "God loves it when you ask questions." Yeah, yeah it, it, He loves it when you ask questions because you're engaging. So I like that. Yeah. Well, since since that time, I've discovered that questions were a big part of the way Jesus taught. Mm -hmm. Now, even people who don't believe in Jesus and their faith system respect Jesus 
because of his teachings. But what about his questions? I think that's fascinating. I had sat down at breakfast with a friend of mine who was a mentor. He said, by the way, did you know that Jesus asked 288 questions? And I just looked at him and said, you counted them? <laughs> you? He said, yes. I stayed up all night. I counted 288 questions. So to find that my questions were okay and that I didn't automatically have to find an answer for everything and that the good life did not necessarily consist of being 100% certain about everything that I believed freed me to understand and grow. And I realized through time, and I, uh, I love to talk about belief systems because yeah. I really think that at the heart of a belief system is a pattern of ideas. And we think of, you know, an idea, it's a thought or conception about reality, but we all have ideas. Is there a God or isn't there? You know, is the world designed or was it, did it come about through random chance processes? And the way you answer some of those initial questions will change. Remember Jim Clifton from the Gallup organization said the average person uh, faces or makes 10,000 to 20,000 decisions every single day. Wow. Okay. So every decision we make is gently nudged one direction or another based on what we believe to be true about those first big questions. So if you say, well, I don't think about the first big questions, well, then each decision you make is kind of randomly unassociated with all the other decisions you make. And it's very, that's what people wonder. Why don't I have a sense of coherence in my life? Why don't I feel like things are coming together? Because we haven't uh, trained ourselves to look for the patterns of what success looks like in our lives. Now we think about it in business. Yes, sure. When you, when you make investments, you strategy. You when you make business investments, you say, okay, here's a model that we're going to uh, implement. And we're going to see if this works. And if it's profitable at the level that we expect, then we'll say that the model is good. If it's not, then we make adjustments to it. Maybe we have to scrap the model altogether and start an, a new model. That's what you do in business. Same thing in sports. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you try, you try your plays. Well, the other team gets a vote. Yes. Your, play, your play doesn't work the way you You're not the only one on the field, are you? <laughs> So, so you, then you readjust and you try to figure out what kind of patterns will lead you to obtain victory over your opponent in the allotted amount of time. They're trying to do the same thing. So really every sports competition is a battle of philosophies about you're gonna approach patterns. Them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Are we going to push through when we don't feel like we're going to make it? Are we going to take opportunities that arise? Well, the same thing is true well, in business, as, athletics, and as, in life. As a sports person, I, you know, I'm a Detroit Lions fan. Um, I'm a Purdue fan, and recently with the Orlando Magic. So we've got a lot of lessons at what doesn't work, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. You, you know, it comes this comes through really true. I'm a Colorado guy, organize. so I, I sympathize. Sympathize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how, how you how you organize yourself. So yeah. talk. So as you're going, that it, it's fascinating. I think you're really. You're, you're hitting and framing, and, and maybe I'll try to put some different words to it, and, and you tell me if that works. The what's the role of a belief system in our life? You're talking about it, you know, in, in business and sport. Talk a little bit more, because because the whole idea of this podcast, as we're as we're talking with an audience here, is, is to explore belief systems, if you will, or or topics where people have strong beliefs, but also encourage them to explore their own. We're not going to try to give answers. Right. We're going to try to articulate perspectives, tell stories and things of that nature. Yeah. But the whole purpose is that somebody listening will go, okay, how does that apply to me? What am I going to do? That's yeah. And so maybe, maybe as we frame this discussion a little bit, talk about the role and you were already. So maybe keep, maybe I interrupted and you're already, <laughs> you're already on a roll. You're already going with, it, and I interrupted, but, um, you know, the real role that it plays in our lives personally, maybe beyond theoretically, but personally, I don't know if there's any, you know, stories or examples that you might, might have in that frame. Well, this is something you probably expect a philosopher to say, but, <laughs> uh, what you, what you believe about belief systems is based on core beliefs about the nature of belief system. Sure. So I start with the recognition that, uh, the world is rationally intelligible which I know uh, sounds obvious, 
but it isn't obvious to most people. And in history, so, so say what you mean by that. Keep so, so the world is the world is rationally intelligible. I can understand it mm-hmm. in the course of time. So if a scientist does an experiment at time A and does the same experiment at time B, they know they are conducting the experiment in the same world. Right. Okay. Now, a lot of people say, why does that matter? Because only people who believed that the world is rationally intelligible because someone made it who is rationally intelligent uh-huh. can have that sort of philosophy. All of modern science developed out of this core belief that's so basic that we don't even stop and think about, think it, about it. We don't think about it anymore. No, no. Like you, 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 drive, you drive home at the end of the day. Sure. And you assume that there are pockets of anti-gravity along the way that can randomly spring your car out into space. Right. Okay. Because we know the law of gravity applies in a certain way that is rationally intelligible. Uh, so I believe that it's not rationally intelligible just because it just happened to be that way right. or just evolved that way. But there was some, there was, that there was a designer, there was, you know, there's a big bang, someone banged it. There was a, you know, there was a, there was a, there was a rationally intelligent plan behind it. So for me, Doug, that gives me a strong sense of confidence that even, especially when things don't go right, you know, I went through a cancer battle and through all these different things, when things don't go right, uh, talk, what do you, what talk, do you do? Talk about that a little bit, because that's personal. That's when belief gets personal. You went through a cancer battle. You went through a health challenge. Yeah. It, and it raises all the questions. And, and it seems like whatever age somebody is, they never think, you know, that the end is near, but we never know. No. Uh, so talk about that a little bit, if if, if you can, I can if, if you will. My cancer battle took me completely off guard. Yeah. My grandfather smoked and drank and ate bacon every single day his whole life and <laughs> lived until age 91. So I figured, <laughs> you know, I have, I have a long... That's the model. I have a long way to go. <laughs> I'm living better than he did. I know I'm living better. I'm exercising. I'm, I'm trying to eat, have a healthier diet. So, so finding out that I had a kind of cancer that would kill me if it wasn't treated was a total shock. Yeah. I realized as I went through the process of the treatment that we, we could treat it successfully, that we had a very good chance. You know, you, this, at this point you're dealing with percentages. Nobody will give you any guarantees, but we have an X percent chance of beating this. How do you know? Because of every hundred people who get this, this many live and this many die. Yeah. Okay. So we have an X percent chance of beating it. The treatment is going to be very aggressive, very aggressive. I had 66 hours of chemo infusions. Wow. Wow. But during the process, Doug, I came to realize every day is a gift. You know, if you you think you're facing the end, we know we're all facing the end. Sure. Sure. Okay. Everybody who's listening or watching right now realizes one out of every one person dies. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> we are facing the that's, end. That's a, that is not a percentage. <laughs> well, <I guess> <laughs> that's right. Percent, but yeah, yeah. Your, your chances are not very good <laughs> getting out of this life alive. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. But, but here's the cool thing. When you realize your time is short, then you treat every conversation differently, don't you? Every phone call you have, you have a different approach. Might be the last time I ever get to talk to this person. If I want to tell them I love them, I tell them I love them. Yeah. If if this if this is the last letter I get to write to someone, if I've always been thinking I need to heal this relationship and you want to get it done. So for me, I was an author and I had a book contract and I had to decide, is this really the book that I want to write if this is the last thing I ever get to write? So all of that was going through my mind. Sure. And it all it came back to, wow, you know what? The pain is inevitable. It's up to me to decide whether the pain I'm experiencing will be productive toward meaning in life or whether whether it will further cynicism and a sense of hopelessness about life. And I can make that decision because way, way, way back I decided my life is not an accident. Right. There's a whole, there's a point to all of this. You know, I, we, you know, in our family, we had a somewhat similar, somewhat similar experience with my father with heart disease. Where he had his first, you know, heart situation in the 1980s, uh, heart attack in the early 90s. That was his second bypass surgery. 
to the point where he required a heart transplant. And it was an interesting, it was an interesting um, process because as we explored options, in the United States, he got rejected by every heart transplant wow. you know, program that there was. Yeah. He was too old. Mm -hmm. He was diabetic. He'd already had a heart attack. He'd already had bypass. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a program in England that thought they would accept him. Yeah. But he had to have the meeting with the doctor. And the doctor said simply, why do you want to live? Wow. Why do you want to live? And I happened to, to, to be there. My uh, uh, One of my brothers was there with me as well. And and he said, I've got children. I've got grandchildren. I want to watch them grow up. I want to be at their games. I want to be at their graduations. I want to be at their weddings. I want to be, and then, I think I have a role. I think I have something to add. I think I can be there to do this. So that's why I'm pursuing this. And, and the doc says, it's going to be hard. You went through multiple chemo treatments. That's not easy. You feel terrible. Yeah. So it's going to be hard. And, you know, he was 70, 71 at the time. And, and, you know, so are you up for this? Are you willing to fight for this? Because if you're not going to fight for your purpose, your meaning for staying alive on this earth, then why are we going to go through this? I think that's fascinating. And, and so the doctor was a philosopher. A little bit of one. You know, <laughs> a little bit you know, because... Yes, yeah. you could get to the place where you think, I feel a whole lot worse than I thought I did. I'm not going to try. Yeah. And he wanted to know, am I wasting time? Yeah, exactly. Somebody had to waste, you, somebody had to die for you to get this hard. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's a, there's a part of the story. Let me let me tell you that one, though. Yes, somebody did have to die. Um, there was a, a, a motorcycle accident of a young man. Uh, this The heart surgery was done in, in England. A young man in Czechoslovakia. They harvested his heart and lungs. They, they did a heart and lung transplant in a woman who survived. Her heart was perfect for dad. So his donor, he got to meet. <laughs> it, it, I'll, I'll send you that book that. too, but that is isn't, so that, isn't, that, isn't, that, isn't that unique that, yeah. That, yeah. that in this whole cycle, that, and as the doctor said, it was better to do a heart and lung transplant on this woman. It was better than to do... Uh, just the heart transplant then on on dad. And he became the oldest living uh, heart transplant recipient when he died at the age of 92. There was no one who had received a yeah, heart. Yeah. He lived for another 21 wonderful years. Well, he lived more life on borrowed time than anybody else I have ever met. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and you know your your time, you know, my time was up. Yeah. Yeah. It's at, at age 71. Yeah. So every day is a gift. Yeah. Every day is borrowed time. Yeah. You live totally differently if you have that perspective. Exactly right. You take risks differently. You treat people differently. And that's the role, right? That's the role of a belief system in yes. your life. If the, you know, so you have that, that ability to make a decision, right? And that's what we're talking about here as we talk to you know, the audience of folks who are listening to this conversation. Yeah. Whatever your belief system is, it, it's fundamental to guide those other decisions. Now, now, now yeah. talk a little bit about in one of the one of the pieces with with Summit Ministries that that, that, that you were part of for a long time that you're you're leading um, today was this statistic that so many people raised in the church mm -hmm. leave the church, yeah. and so the question is, what do they go to? Do they replace the belief system? Do they just simply reject the re belief system? Do they, uh, uh, you know, you know, do they, re you know, how, how do they then, what's that mean uh, to them and what impact does that decision have on their life that, that you've seen and that you maybe even experienced when you were young because you were in the process of thinking it through yourself? Yeah, I always feel like I have to got to preface in these remarks for different things. That's just the <laughs> philosopher coming out. I'm a complete nerd. But our belief system... I, I love it. This, it's really important because I haven't a clue how to answer yeah. those questions. I get to ask the questions. You get to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> well, our beliefs, there's something before our beliefs, and that is our ideas. Okay. Our ideas. Thought or conception about reality. That's the very first thing, your ideas. Then your ideas, what ideas you be, you believe form your beliefs. That's where we. That's why we talk about belief system. But it goes deeper, Doug. There's a, there's a third level. The third level is the level of your conviction. What beliefs are you willing to sacrifice for? If you decide you want to start a successful business, it 
will hurt. It will be painful. It will require you to give up things that are a source of comfort for you in your life. Yeah. You, so what are your convictions? But the same thing is true in, you know, in the political world. When William Oberforce decided to fight against slavery, right. he, he had to test his beliefs. Are they strong enough that they can form convictions that I'm willing to sacrifice for? Because he was a member of the upper class, he was going to lose his reputation by fighting for the least of these. And then finally, is habits. So ideas to beliefs to convictions to habits. You live based on what you are willing to sacrificially believe. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So now back to the uh, to, to the question that we're that we're kind of getting at here. How do you make sense of all of this when you're in the middle of a really difficult season, a really difficult yeah. Yeah. time? That's when you've got to test those ideas. Now, there's a like if you're refining metals, yeah, uh, you have to you have to burn, you have to put them at a really high temperature. And then the stuff that's not pure enough to be part of the final product comes to the surface and you can scrape it away, but it's got to be heated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you've got to be, you, you, another way of thinking of it is you've got to have your time in the desert. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. And you, you, I know you read a lot, a lot of biographies of leadership. Virtually every leader you've ever read of had a time in the desert. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's what's defined you. You got to lose yeah. the game before you learn how to have a better game plan next time. I, I joke a lot about the teams I follow and, and, and that I cheer for all the time, no matter what. But it's through those t tough times that you look at yourself and say, what am I going to do to get better? We know it on an everyday basis. If you think, I, you know, I really want to get in shape this year. Yeah. I really want to get in shape. But you wouldn't go to the gym and say, you know, I've, I really want to get in shape. I want really good looking muscles. Yeah. So give me the lightest possible weights yeah. and the easiest possible routine. Yeah, not going to get there. I mean, you could do that kind of a routine. Sure. It might might help you a little bit, but it's not going to reach your objective. Right, right. So at the time in the in the crucible, yeah. as they say. When you talk about time, talk about that a little bit more. Of So you have these ideas that turn into belief. A lot of times people, like we were saying, you know, they, they grow, something happens, and then they move away from a belief system that they may have had. Yeah. How much time do they spend or how much time should our, our audience in their lives think about? How much time does it take to really crystallize that idea, turn it into belief that you will have conviction about and that becomes a habit in your life? How, how, how much time has to be in stage one? Well, that, that's my greatest fear with the young adults that I work with is that they leave the church, but not to something you know, I tell my students, because I'm, I'm working with a lot of young adults, in their career, there's a lot of churn. Sure. You know, but I tell them, I want you to never leave from something, but I want you to leave to sure. something. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't see that happening. I think that's the heart of my concern. Okay. It's not that I'm asking people, you know, something happened to you in high school, you wanted to go be a missionary or whatever, and now you don't even want to believe anything at all. Uh, you know, that's sort of sad. Yeah. I'm judging you. No, it's not that at all. It's what happened in your life that you lost the plot to the point where now you believe that a life that has no chance of getting meaning is somehow better than a life where there was meaning, but you didn't agree with everybody on everything yeah. when you were around. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, I, I, I just it makes perfect sense. I yeah. just want people to understand that if the reality is really real, it's, it is in time. It is a story that flows through time and you're part of it. Yeah. You're part of your, your story is a subplot in a bigger story that history isn't just some series of events. History is happening on purpose and it's going somewhere on purpose. Right. Right. And we're part of it. And we're part and of it. And we have a chance to do something in it. As you talked about earlier, we have an opportunity to say, you know, we, we can make a decision of these 10,000 decisions that we make every day. We can make them in a pattern. We can make them in a direction. We can we can make them towards an objective that um, that aligns with our beliefs, or we can just randomly pick it from time to time. And then you know, what's the, what's the old thing? You know, if you don't know where you're going, that any road will get you there. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. You, you know, and it's the same sort of sort of feeling there. But talk talk a little bit. Let let me go you because 
you know, doc, you're Dr. Jeff. <laughs> you're, you're Dr. Jeff, Dr. Jeff Myers. You take these thoughts and you study them and you crystallize them and you write about them. And you talked earlier about writing a book and your, your, your most recent book, Truth Changes Everything. Everything. Talk a little bit about that. And, and again, in the context, you know, for, for the, from the reader, you know, it, how, how do they, after they go through, and there's some more things you wrote about it, <laughs> but, um, you know, how would, talk a little bit about the book, and then we can kind of talk a little bit about how someone might want to digest the book yeah. or, 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 or take it in on their own. Remember what I was going through. Yeah. I, I read a lot of books. I very rarely think. What was the author going through when they were writing the book? Right. Yeah. I, it, that hadn't occurred to me until I was in a place where I was going through this cancer battle. Okay. I couldn't do anything, really. I, I couldn't have meetings. I tried to have meetings. I'd have a 15 minute meeting. I'd have to sleep for an hour. But I could write and I could read. It was the strangest thing. Really? You had energy for that? I had the energy for that. So I took the time to write, to read, to study, and to write. I brought the people in my cancer center into it, you know, and well, I'm, this is what I'm reading about. What do you think? And, you know, and so there was, so it started all of a sudden just started these wa waves of conversations all around my life about the things, about the impact of ideas. Okay. So here's where I went with, okay. I think we're in a crisis of truth. And I, I used the term truth, capital T truth, what it really is. I think people have given up the idea that you can find truth yeah. because if, if, if Part of having a life where you believe that something rationally intelligible is happening here is that you can uh, explore and find truth even when it's hard. You can still pursue it. Yeah. But a lot of people have given up on that idea. They stop to the, you know, don't seek the truth, speak your truth, uh, right? So they have this whole different, now there's different, people say that in different ways. You know, people say, speak your truth, man. You know, yeah, what they yeah. mean is just give your opinion and yeah. give it some oomph, right? Show your convictions. But more often than not, coming from the academic world, when people talk about speak your truth, what they mean to say is there is no ultimate truth that is knowable by us. All we have are our personal experiences. So that's the only basis of what we know to be true or how to pursue what is good for our lives. As I studied this, I thought, I think the Greeks had a lot going for them. The Romans, you know, they're a big part of our tradition. They said there was such a thing as truth, but they missed something. They didn't understand that truth isn't just a mathematical formula or a logical proposition. It's very personal. It's a person. And a little weird theology here just to show you how completely nerdy I am. I like it. Be nerdy. That's great. Do you love it? Okay. <laughs> I do uh, love it because I, I think, because one of the things that is important, you know, I'm not, I, I have ideas, but I don't know the same level of depth. And I think sometimes a lot of, you know, what we want to do here is talk to people who study this. So I'm guessing there's a lot of people like me who don't study this in depth. That's why it's so important to have the conversation with you. Yeah. Well, here's, here's, here's how the process went okay. yeah, from, this is from, this is my work. This is how my head works. I, I, I had studied a lot of philosophy. The Greeks had this concept that they used to describe the obviousness of reality. Mm -hmm. You're, you walk outside the door and you see that the bridge is gone. If you take one more step, down you go. All right. Even if you're thinking thoughts of upness, you still go down. <laughs> down. <laughs> There's an obviousness to reality. This word that they use for the obviousness of reality is logos. L-O-G-O-S. Logos. Well, you know that the a lot of scripture, the New Testament part of scripture, the original language where those manuscripts were found, was the was an ancient kind of Greek language called Koine Greek. And you read John, book of John, a lot of people know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, the, the gospels. The gospels. So John 1 starts off, in the beginning was the, what's the Greek word? Logos. The word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In other words, the logos, the obviousness of reality, isn't just a static concept, it's a dynamic being. And John's claim was, it's Jesus. Yeah. Now, entirely aside from whether that claim is true, people who believed it changed the course of history. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And that's what the book is about, just telling their stories, how they changed the course of history in science, art, education, politics, justice, even the whole idea of why we work the way we do. How do people... So 
that, that that's fascinating because we accept it is what it is today, right? It's you know I'll, I'll speak my truth or I'll give my opinion, but you know, you know there's a reason why institutions or ideas that we accept today were you know were put in place because somebody studied them, somebody had a purpose, and and there's a process that brought us here. Talk a little bit more about that. Let me give an example from. The America's founding, okay. because I know that's something that's important to you, and and uh, and your dad talked and wrote about this a sure. lot. Very, very important. And your your family has been very helpful in focusing uh, attention on the Constitution and just different things. So let me tell you a story about that. Great. Uh, America's founders had to try to figure out who they would turn to for sources about what our new nation should be, and they kind of had two options. They had the option of people like Voltaire and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who believe that humans have a pure nature. And if you put people in charge, they will automatically do what is right. They will not be corrupt. <laughs> they will be able to leave behind their corruption. They will be pure. The other view coming from people... <laughs> so so how, how, how much did that gain traction? Uh, well, it... Uh, it became the basis of the French Revolution. Okay. 40,000 people lost their heads in Paris. The blood flowed in the streets. Yeah. And every revolutionary movement since that time has been based on that idea. Wow. Even up to the Marxist revolutions. Okay. okay. So you know where this goes. Yeah. Okay. The Americans so keep, said- Keep going. Most of them, most of the founders said, I don't think that's right. I think, the, I think it's the case that we were designed- that we're here on purpose, but that something went wrong. We have a fallenness to us. That's the term they used. There's a there's something wrong with us. If people get into a position of power and they don't have accountability, they will become corrupt. Not because they want to become corrupt, but because it is the nature of humanity. And the people they turned to for sources to this were people like uh, John Locke. Samuel Rutherford was another one. Guy was a Presbyterian pastor. Uh -huh. And he wrote a book called Lex Rex, which in Latin means the law is king. Now think about that for a minute. The other view said, no, the king is the law. Right. Because the leader is pure, whatever they do is automatically right. right. Yeah. yeah. And he said, no, no, the king has to obey the law. Yeah. Well, the king of England at that time did not like this concept at all. Right. He sent his soldiers to arrest Rutherford. His plan was to bring him to London, uh, give him a fair trial, and then hang him. That's what that was his plan. <laughs> and he, we know the result. We just have to go through the process. Result. You got to go through the process, make it look good. Well, Rutherford died before the soldiers arrived. Okay. His final words were, I have been summoned by a higher authority. Wow. Well, all of a sudden, the horse is out of the barn. No longer can the king say, whatever I do is right because I am the king. Everybody realized, no, the king is subject to the laws just like all the rest of us. And the founders of America chose that approach. They said, in the Constitution, we're going to account for the fallenness of people by having three branches of government that will hold one another accountable, and that will postpone corruption. Well, where did they get this idea? Well, you look back at the writings of the founders, and it's fascinating and controversial. You know where they got it? From the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> they actually went back in scripture. Donald Lutz is a political science history professor at the University of Houston. He examined 15,000 documents related to America's founding and found that the Bible was cited by the founders more than all other sources put together. Wow. Well, they weren't just trying to find Bible verses because we, we know people like that. Right, Here's right. your Bible verse, you know, yeah. that proves yeah. that I'm right and you're wrong, you know, big mic drop moment. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we'll, we'll go through some of the cliches that you, that you read and talked about. Yeah, we, we talk about cliches yeah, a lot because I, I want to I want to help people get beyond the bumper sticker way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but one of the things that um, that I realized is that they were looking back at the ancient Hebrews and said, "Well, God designed this. What did He design? He didn't design a theocracy. Right. He designed a republic." Okay. And so and and people now still look at this. Eric Nelson, the professor at Harvard University, and he's written a book called the, about the Hebrew Republic, the Hebrew mm -hmm. century. And he said, yeah, that's what they had in the ancient Hebrew times. It wasn't a theocracy. 
Because I've, I've heard people say, though I live in Colorado, so you hear this kind of thing all the time. You vote for that person, they're a Christian. And they're going to turn our state into a theocracy, and they're going to make everybody do what, they, what their religious docu documents say. Okay? But that's not the kind of government that you see in the Old Testament. You see a republic with a judiciary, with a legislature, and with an executive branch. And, and so it was fascinating. See, I just, to me, that's so interesting. They had to decide that question. Certainly would feel nicer if we believed that all human beings are pure and we're always motivated by good things. Yeah. And you would think that, well, if you think that it's not that way, the human beings are falling, you're negative. Yeah. You know, you're being cynical. But it turns out that that actually leads to the better life. So it changed the whole system of politics. And we now have more political freedom on this planet probably than any time in the world's history. history. So, so I, I, again, if we take that, that you're following that, that process, you come up with the idea, you create, you know, so they went out in search of the idea and they evaluated different ones. They found one that they believed in, right? And they, you know, put their, <laughs> yeah. put their lives on the line they did. To, to do it through the declaration and the revolutionary war. And then they created the habits of the constitution. I'm trying, I'm kind of making this up as I go along, but I'm trying to use your words to, to, to find our way there. Uh, and just as you're talking about that, I, I, I we mentioned I, I've involved with the national constitution center. And one of my first visits to Philadelphia I went to independence hall, ranger Terry Brown walked us through independence hall and he was talking about the paintings and the people that were part of there, and 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 he asked if we knew who they were. And our tour group all looked at each other and <laughs> you know scuffled our feet and said, "Yeah, we we don't know." And he was slightly disappointed with us. And then he told the story about George Washington, George Washington, the father of our country, and he said, "You know, George Washington uh, decided." You know, after his second term, he wasn't going to run again. Yeah. However, had he run, he most surely would have won. Of course. Then history shows that he would have died in office. And and then he pointed back to the paintings and he said, then everybody else would have said, that's how you do it. So maybe there's still a little good in some people, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, but it's maybe that he wasn't inherently good. It was that he had an idea and he knew the idea had to go beyond him. Does that make sense? I, I, I think it actually accounts for the idea of the goodness of somebody like George Washington and better to recognize that human beings are fallen. Yeah. He understood if he were to continue, we, we know somebody can be president, they, they've got a system of accountability set up, it's going, to, it's going to work. But if you let somebody be president forever, their time horizon then changes every single decision they make from that point forward, and they inevitably move toward corruption. Yeah. Uh, it took a long time. It was an American tradition for a long time before it was put into the Constitution that each president can only serve two terms. Right. But it was still a tradition that worked all the way up until the crises of World War II. Right. People just knew, you know, you get your time. You yeah. get your time. You do your best in the limited amount of time that you have, in the limited time frame with the accountability system that's set in place allows you to be successful. And then when you're done, you walk away, yeah. you retire from public life, let somebody else and you let somebody else do it. And you just have to trust that the times that you had were the right times for you and the right times for the nation. Yeah. And that, you know, you just do your best. Yeah. There's a value in just knowing that I did my best yeah. with the time that I had, I don't have to try to do it forever. Right. Right. And, and so these continue to be examples that are, that are personal to many people, um, but are reflections of somebody's belief system, uh, of somebody's perspective on truth yeah. in their life. And, and when we talk about uh, in belief systems, or we talk about belief and the role it plays in our life, you can see by these examples and these stories, the role it plays in the history of the world because yeah. if somebody has one perspective and they gather enough power to act in that way it generates a result and if somebody else gathers power to act in a different way it generates a set of results and we can presumably learn 
about what sort of belief system drives what sort of results as you articulated yeah. that example. Yeah. Now, now take it again, personally in life, what are some of the examples that you, that you have seen or experienced when, when you, you, you see somebody who, who either w with one belief system leads to negative results or with a belief system that leads to positive results for themselves and maybe in those around them. I have a lot of conversations with one of my sons who has worked in his career as a drug addiction counselor. Mm. Uh, and I became very concerned during COVID that we would see people who had previously been weak in, in developing resolve against their addictions or that they, they, they just would lose that resolve. Right. They might fall back into their addictions. They might see, I don't, just don't think I can make it anymore. I need, I need the alcohol or drugs or porn or whatever people right. would be addicted to to soothe the pain and the anxiety. And uh, I was asked to comment on this in the media often. So my son helped me as, as a source of information. You know, what are the young men that you're working with actually going through? And it was, it was fascinating to me how he would describe the addict, the addict is in a way at the same time, they're responsible, they're an agent, but at the same time, they're a victim. They might choose to use that drug at the beginning, but after a while it chooses them and they have to have somebody else who can come alongside and help them conquer the addiction and regain that sense of agency. That's how philosophers talk about it. We're agents. In other words, we can do things on purpose. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I think going, uh, you know, kind of walking with my son through that and him sharing those experiences gave me a new sensitivity to the power of, of uh, bad ideas and bad thinking in people's lives. Because growing up, sometimes we say, well, you're a healthy adult, it's because you had a healthy upbringing. And there's a lot of truth to that, mm -hmm. that a lot of people didn't have a healthy upbringing. And the decisions on the part of their caregivers, day by day, you know, they still look the same on the outside, but they don't, they can't make the right choices. They're still responsible for the choices, but the likelihood of them making wrong ones is, goes up. Increased. Yeah. It's increased. So that's why I asked my son, so is there any help for this? And he said, there's only one thing that has ever helped break in people's lives, the cycle of addiction. I said, really? Because I want to know what it is. I'm working with thousands of young people every year. And he said, God, that is it. It's the only thing that has ever helped. Yeah. That's a story just, you know, from the last couple of years that just made me think, yeah, I need some power to come alongside of me to help me get a breakthrough that I simply cannot possibly get on my own, on my own. Right. Yeah. So we do the same thing. Accountability. We talk about accountability. We talk about finding mentors. I'm always telling young people. We give you four words. You need old people. <laughs> <laughs> I tell my kids that all the time. <laughs> 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 you need us. Come on. You, get, you, you should bring us coffee or something. <laughs> Gifts, whatever the case may be. You, you, can I take you to coffee? I teach my students that. Can I take you to coffee and learn? Yeah. Uh, that, that's one of the most important things you can do. I don't personally know anybody who was successful in business or any other major pursuit who did not have the idea that there were wise people out there who, who could be sought out yeah. and who might be willing to contribute and help to break the cycles, not just of addiction, but of passivity or negative thinking. Yeah. You know, I, there, a lot of times we're right. I don't take a chance because I just think I'm going to fall flat on my face and I just don't feel like being embarrassed. Right. But maybe I should take the chance. Well, who's going to help me? Somebody who's been there who said, you know what? If you fall, who cares? Yeah. You just get back, back up. up. Get yeah. back up. That's the whole thing. You yeah. Move on. You make a mistake and yeah. it doesn't kill you. Make you stronger. <laughs> make sure it's not a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You, you don't want to walk on that bridge that isn't there. Yeah, that, that, that might be one of those, uh, uh, career ending mistakes. If it doesn't so, kill you, it can make you feel really, really bad. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Talk about, I, I got, a, I got a few more things that in, in the time that we have here that, it, that I want to go through. Um, because we, you, you, 
in in that sense, I wanted to kind of try to illustrate or or, or yeah. maybe dive a little bit deeper into the distinction or or the depth of of a belief system is is somebody in the audience is is thinking about what they believe. Mm -hmm. Because there's one thing that's wisdom. Okay, we're going to talk to all people. We're going to get that. But there's another thing that's faith. Yeah. That that goes back to truth that changes everything. And, and there's a lot of times where people would say, and as it, you even said earlier, um, you know, people look at Jesus' teachings and they 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 um, you know appreciate them and they think it's great, but they don't accept the claim of who he said he was. And they would look at other religious figure, uh, figures or other sorts of things, and they would kind of pick ancient wisdom. And that's not a bad thing. But what's the distinction, uh, or how do you distinguish then between accumulating wisdom and, and then living a life of faith? And, and does that change your level of conviction, your level of, your, your, your willingness to sacrifice. Um, talk about that a little bit, because I think that's an, an interesting thing. You know, I always think, I, I remember a, you know, a, a, a photo somewhere of a, you know, Newsweek cover years and years ago of an army helicopter landing somewhere and everyone heading out the back. Yeah. And, or, or think of D-Day or think of where people are going, and that may be the last thing they do on this earth. Right. Why did they do it? Their depth of belief or their level of commitment that their belief drove mm -hmm. this incredibly high risk behavior, as you talk about uh, yeah. Wilberforce, you know, this, you know, you're going to put yourself at risk. Maybe, maybe help us understand the, the depth of, of what wisdom brings and then the depth of what faith could bring. Yeah. So, so Doug, I'm, I don't, I come, I, come at this as a philosopher, not a theologian. Okay. I'm not a pastor, I'm not a minister. So my, my answer to the question, I hope doesn't sound irreverent. Okay. But I don't think of faith as blind faith. Okay. I think, I think of faith as a justified true belief that we, we, in other words, you have faith, not just for the sake of faith, you have faith in things that you have good reason to believe are true. Okay. So I flew to Michigan on an airplane. Um, I did not interrogate the pilot beforehand. I did not ask, what are your flying credentials? How many hours do you have? Right. Um, have you ever flown this kind of aircraft before? Yeah. Have you ever crashed? You know, the, <laughs> I didn't ask any of those questions. I went and sat in my seat right. because I trusted the airline to have made all of those decisions for me. Right. I trusted the engineers who made the airplane to figure out the principle of lift <laughs> and apply it to a machine that was that big yeah. with that many people in it to actually get it into the air and safely bring it down out of the air. Yeah. All of those things are indications of faith, aren't they? Once I'm inside, I have no control over what happens. Right. But I have faith that this flight will be like the others I've taken and that we're part of a system that works. Okay. So I just, I had good reasons to believe that my decision to get on that airplane and seal myself inside of an aluminum tube that was be going at 500 miles an hour at 35,000 feet in the air would be a good idea. Yeah. That's... When you think about it that way, I'm starting to get a little nervous about my next flight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, but every day I'm making those decisions. Uh, I rode here in a car yeah. to your office, and I trust by faith that other people understand that they drive on that side of the road if they're coming toward me, and I drive on this side of the road if I'm, you know. It, You're exactly right. You no, know, it could be different. If you go to England, they switch it. It, it's not so important whether it's on the right or the left. It's important that everyone agrees <laughs> that's right. that it's on the right or the left. Okay. And, and, but that's a decision by faith. Right. There are people out there coming toward us down the street, 45 miles an hour. We're going to them at 45 miles an hour. If we collided head on, no one survives right. that. But we, in faith, make all of those decisions. So faith, be, believing in what you have good reason to believe is true enables risk in your life. 
well, what's the difference then between faith and the collected wisdom that you get through time? Not all sayings of wisdom are equally wise. Okay. And what the way the scripture puts it is this, wisdom is known by its doing. <laughs> the wisdom is known by its doing. It's not just to say that something is true if it works, but it is to say that if it is true, it works. Yes, it will work. Okay, it will work. So that's why you have to look through history. You have to look back in time and ask, if somebody embraces this idea versus that idea, what happens? Not just over the course of one day or one week or one month or one year, but over 50 years or 100 years or 200 years. And this is why you have the historian George Santiana said, if you fail to learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. Right, right. So I, that's how I think you do it. Uh, so you, so you, sometimes we get on the internet, we think, oh, that quote sounds so smart. Well, is it really? <laughs> because maybe the person's philosophy would actually be really horrible if you lived it out. Right. So you've got to rethink and we'd have to go beyond just idea, this idea that if it sounds good on a bumper sticker, it is good. Yeah. And we actually have to think, what's my belief system? How do I process all of these pieces all put together? Well, talk, talk about that a little. We'll, we'll go to the cliches because I, <laughs> I, 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 you know, because I, I think it's what you're talking about here and, and what we're trying to express for folks is that it's not blind faith. And you, you said that earlier. It's, um, you, know, you don't just say, and as the cliches go, you know, just have faith, you, you know, or just, uh, it's just me and Jesus, or, you know, not my place to judge. Um, you know, you, you kind of go, go through a number of these things, you know, a relationship, not religion. Uh, you know, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I wrote, a, I, I wrote a, talk whole... about that a little bit. Are these, cause I, I read these, I'm like, <laughs> I say some of these things. You know, <laughs> I've lived yeah. some of these things. Now, wait a minute. I'm, I, I got to check myself here. So, sometimes when I write a book, I have myself as the first audience. Okay. I wrote this. It was a different book. It was called Unquestioned Answers. Okay. Because I realized a lot of the students, young adults I work with, and some of the ministries, the main thing is students come for two weeks at a time. We, answer, we help them find answers. Bring all of your hard questions with you. And we'll have experts here who all have are faithful people. They will help you find answers to these questions that can help you give a, get a sense of purpose in life, stand strong for the truth, and become leaders. Uh, so I kind of have all of them in, in mind. And I wrote this book called Unquestioned Answers because I realized some people come with unanswered questions, some people come with unquestioned answers. Like they, they think they know what they believe, but they've never really thought it through. Right. So I kind of pointed the finger back to back at myself and asked, what are some of the things in my life that I have believed without really thinking about them? Right. Okay. This is how nerdy I am. Okay. I like it. So I like I, it. I just started making a list. What are some of those things? When people say, just have faith, you know what they mean usually is just, you know, I, I'm, I'm cheering for you. I don't know how to say this exactly, but I hope you succeed. Sure. I want to see you succeed. But boy, that's a whole lot better than people are envious. Like, yeah. you know, they're secretly saying, I hope you fail. fail. Because <laughs> I want to, I want to have it on video. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, so that's great. That's fine. You know, the people want that they want the best for other people. I think that's a good instinct, but to say, just have faith is to kind of indicate that faith is somehow more just luck. Yeah. Like you just keep going and maybe you'll get lucky. That's not really how life works. No, if you, if you had a coach, you think oh, our school's going to hire a coach. And the coach said, you asked, what's your coaching philosophy? And the coach said, I, you know, I just, we're just going to go out there on the court and hopefully we'll get lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they won't be a coach very long, will they? No, I mean, you'd say, yeah, I think we'll pass. Yeah. You know, maybe you should go work for the lottery commission. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. Cause, because that philosophy is not going to get you anywhere. But if you have, you think of faith as, believing and what I have good reasons to believe would be true, uh, then all of a sudden faith is something very different. It's not just blind. You don't have faith just for the sake of having faith. You have faith because there's meaning and purpose that pulls all this whole thing together. Yeah. So that's an example of one. 
And sometimes people will say things like, you know, like there's a little country song, George Jones, just me and Jesus, you know, I don't really care what you think. But is that really the way we want to live our lives? Because the truth is, if that's how it is, it's just me and Jesus, then what do I even need other people for? for yeah. Uh, but the, the idea is that we're a body, yeah. so that I, I'm an arm maybe. And if, if you see an arm laying on the sidewalk, you know something really horrible has happened because the arm needs the body and the body needs the arm. And, and all of a sudden you think, well, wait a second, that's not just the principle for a good church. That's how it works in business. That's right. Right? It's a team. You figure out, yeah. here, uh, I'm Doug, here are my strengths, one, two, three, four, five. And then you say, I am Doug, and here are my weaknesses. If you put these, if you put me in charge of these five things, I'll the, fail. The, ca the, the catastrophic failure is exactly. going to be awesome to see, <laughs> right? So what do you do? You hire people whose strengths complement your strengths that together you can do something that would enable you to be successful. Exactly. Let's see how that's just, that starts with a belief. Yeah. It starts with a belief. I'm not just out here all on my own. Yeah. It's not just my friend in the sky and me. Right. You know, that, that part of what, what Jesus demonstrates to us is the importance of binding together strength to strength. And becoming a whole body. Becoming a whole body. You know, that's the, that's, that's the whole piece coming in. It. And, but those are, you know, as you said, those are decisions that we make every day. And, yeah. and I think that's the important thing. And I, I'm so grateful for, for your insights and, and for your time as you talk about this and you, as you put out there in your book, the truth does change everything and, and understanding what that is. And there's a, there's a way to, you know, there, there is a truth there. And, and as you say, it's, it, it's not just, yeah. yeah, it's, it's reality. What I'm trying to, what's the right word? Logos? You, you, <laughs> Logos. Yeah. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that, that it's, it's discoverable or it's real and it's, yeah. you know, it's obvious. Yeah. And sometimes to deny that, um, takes you to a place where maybe things aren't obvious. Mm. Maybe things aren't real. Maybe things aren't solid. Yeah. And that's, that's a system you can choose that. A lot of times, you know, a lot of times I just want to be spontaneous. You know, I might go here, I might go there and I, I well, yeah, I, yeah, and I'm a little stuck. I'm a Dutch stuck guy. And I go, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, you can kind of just pick a restaurant right now, but I don't think we'll get a reservation. I don't think we'll get in. I don't want to wait for an hour. I, yeah, yeah, all those sorts of things. So I, I appreciate spontaneity. And I love the creative, you know, and the skills and talents and art and music and all these things that people think, and it just kind of comes yeah. out there, and 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 that's wonderful. Uh, but I don't want to organize my life around. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But that's my uh, that's me, right? Mm. But but people have to make those choices. Well, the, they're different gifts mm. in in humanity, and uh, artistic gifts are more whimsical in the world of business. We make predictions and we set about developing models and then processes to bring those predictions to, to reality. reality. Um, artists don't work that way, yeah. usually. Artists get a concept or an idea. There's some unformed understanding out there that I need to express. And they know it when they see it. If you ever talk to a painter, how do you know which brush stroke is the last? I can't be the only person who's ever asked that question of a painter. <laughs> how, do I know? how do you know? And the answer every time is, I just know. Yeah. Well, see, that doesn't, that's not the way I think. Yeah. But those are the, that's the diversity of gifts yeah, in humanity. That some people celebrate that. That's yes. wonderful. That's right. Yes. So we, th we think that way. But it does go back to our belief system that there's something that needs expressing. There is some aspect to the creation that is uh, still a beginning, even now, that there's still something about it that's still unfolding. And it unfolds, unfolds through every person's life. And w our lives are meaningful. Yeah. And the lives of people around us are meaningful because what's unfolding in their lives unfolds in view of our lives. Yeah. It's connected. It's connected. Yeah. And it's not connected like, you know, some star wars force yeah. kind of thing <laughs> yeah. it's connected because there was an intentionality at the, the beginning you know the first three words of genesis in the beginning or it, you know in the beginning god yeah. uh in in hebrew it's kind of weird it's 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 bereshit uh, bara elohim okay in the beginning god 
It's, it's an untranslatable word, that word Bereshit. Nobody knows, even Jewish people say, look, that's not the way you would say it in Hebrew. The best translation is, that I heard from a, a rabbi, was in the beginning, of the beginning, that is always beginning, God created a creation that is still. That things are all a lot to take in. Yeah. And that it's, it's still, it's like the Sabbath. It's like, it's going to be okay. That there's a, there's a purpose to this. There's a meaning to it. Some of it are, some parts of it are just super hard and it seems stupid. Yeah. <laughs> but we just continue, you know, we continue, we reform our understanding of our, of, the, of our beliefs and how they apply to everything else. And then we move forward with the goal of being a blessing and bringing flourishing. Yeah. Some things are hard, like going through cancer. And, yeah. and, and uh, you just have a belief system that helps you see the purpose and meaning that we have in life. And, and as, as you're right, the truth does change everything. And maybe as we kind of bring this to a, a close here, and, and Dr. Jeff, I'm so, mm -hmm. uh, I'm so grateful for your, your insights. And, and I trust that everybody who's listening or watching this is, you know, uh, you know is challenging themselves and, and that you're, you're really thinking about these things and thinking about what you believe and why you believe it. And and that there's good reason, as you talk about your philosopher, not a theologian. You know, there's good reason to believe these things, and the, these are. This is not the first time in history people have thought about this. That's right. And and, and brought this together. Maybe there's so. Maybe you might have a, a, a story or a, a closing thought about some something that's been really really important to you, and maybe you don't tell the story that often. So if you might want to share that uh, with us of. Uh, uh, you know, something that's been impactful in your life that uh, that could serve to help us as we all kind of ponder these questions. Well, one of the guys on your team warned me that you might ask this question, so I started thinking <laughs> of what I might say, but what I actually decided just now that I wanted, the story I want to share is not one that I had thought of. Okay. But it's something that happened recently. My wife and I had the privilege of going to Israel and to Italy over Christmas. Wow, great. And we had a couple of weeks in Italy, just, just the two of us, just kicking around. And it turned out that we were in Rome on Christmas Day. Wow. So we wanted to go to some kind of a service. It seemed appropriate. We thought, um, you know, but probably not the morning service. You know, their mass is going to be in Italian. You know, and that's, I don't know. We'll, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll, and I found that there was an evensong service at St. Cecilia's, which is a cathedral dedicated to... Uh, the saint, Cecilia, who was the patron saint of music. Sure. So I thought, that'll be great. They'll sing. They'll sing. So we'll go to the Evensong service. And then it won't matter if it's in Italian because, you know, a lot of music. It's music. So we went to the service. We walk in early because we think, oh, man, it's Christmas Day. The service is going to be packed. We walk in. Some people are milling around, looking at some of the exhibits on the in the side areas. And then uh, it's time for the service to start. And we look around and all those people left. And Stephanie and I were sitting there, the only two people wow. in the building. And all of a sudden, the lights came on. The heaters sprang to life. An elderly nun walked up to the organ and began to play. And a procession of 12 elderly nuns, who all had to have been in their 80s or older, shuffled down the aisle, went up, uh, behind the altar and proceeded to uh, have their sung service, their even song. We were the only two people there. And it was beautiful. When they started to sing, it's like they were children's voices. And we both instantly dissolved into tears at the beauty of it, but also at our sense of, you know, where are all the people? I don't, you know, where are all the people? We want to be where there's a lot happening, yeah. you know? Yeah. And here we are. We're the only two. And Stephanie, as we were leaving, uh, she said, I can't believe they did the whole service and we were the only two people here. And I said, I don't think we were their audience. <laughs> their audience. Yeah. Their audience was God. Yeah. We took so much comfort and from that situation that these people were faithful prayers. That's what they do all day long is they pray for the world and they've done it. Even though they see terrible things happen in the world, they continue to pray. 
their level of faith is such that if not one single person shows up to hear this service, we're going to have it because we have an audience of one. That's fascinating. And it's powerful. It's the expression of the belief that they have in their lives. Yeah. And, and that, you're right, they have a perspective of who they're singing for. <laughs> and it was nice that they let you watch. They let us, <laughs> we got to observe. I think that's the most humbling yeah. part. And th when the service was over, they shuffled back down the aisle and left. And it was over. But something had changed in our lives forever. Yeah. Isn't that fabulous? That's a great story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, uh, I, I can, I can, I, I'm going to remember that story a long time mm -hmm. because the, uh, of that, that impact that it had on you. Yeah. And uh, the purpose that that the singers, that the performers at the church, that they had in their lives, yeah, their commitment, yeah, their conviction to it, their idea yeah. to a the belief. idea to a belief to a conviction to a habit to a habit. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Jeff Myers, uh, uh, thank you so much. And, and for all of you who are, are listening, uh, you can understand what Summit Ministries uh, uh, is, and you can see the leadership here of how people, uh, especially young people, can get that foundation in their life and, and make that next step. And, and that's what Summit Ministries is about and how you continue to reach out and, and strengthen that. So you do have answers to your questions. And like you said, when you were starting, when you were young, when you attended, okay, I got a lot of questions, but there are answers. And, uh, but you got to choose them. Right. You got to make your decision uh, and make your choice. And that's one of the, that's why we love to have these sorts of opportunities to explore that with people who are, who are brilliant. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily re refer to Dr. Jeff as a nerd. <laughs> I would, re I would refer to him as a very, very smart and, and uh, incredibly articulate uh, and just a wonderful, uh, wonderful person and a great time to have a Teaching is what I love the most. If I have a chance to teach, that's where my gifts really, uh, that's where I feel uh, God's pleasure. That's where I feel like I'm in my sweet spot. So I, I really, I, I would love for everybody who's listening or watching this podcast, you know, just to be, I, my, my hope for you would be that you find that sweet spot for your life. Yeah. The thing where you, you're so into it, you cannot not do it. Right, all right. That purpose, that, yes. that intentionality yeah. of where you go. Very good. Dr. Jeff, thank you so much, and thank you all for taking time to be with us, and uh, we'll see you next time on Believe. <laughs>